There we go. Feel better. Okay. So the stomach is going to be located on the left side of your body, almost the opposite of the liver. Okay. So the liver is going to be in the upper right quadrant. All right. Whereas the stomach is in the upper left quadrant there. Okay. Right below the diaphragm. So this is where we're going to see a continuation of that mechanical digestion, all right, because we saw a big portion of mechanical digestion occurring in the oral cavity when you're chewing on your food, okay, and you're mixing it with saliva and you're swallowing it down as a bolus. So that bolus will enter into the stomach, and then we're really going to start to see, all right, as that di mechanical digestion decreases, we're going to see an increase in the chemical digestion, okay? So... Two things that we're going to see a considerable amount of digestion uh, uh, occurring of are going to be our fats and protein, okay? Protein is a little bugger. It's tough to break down, okay? Carbohydrates are somewhat too, all right? So we have several steps that we're going to um, implement in the breakdown. When we get into the small intestine, I'm going to break uh, uh, near the end of this chapter, I'm going to talk about all right, the individual macromolecules like carbohydrates and fats and proteins and really how we get those broken down and where that primarily occurs, okay? So I want you to think of the stomach as like, uh, the book refers to it as a holding bag, all right? It's just going to be a location, okay, that we're going to hold some food contents to give the small intestine time to help to digest and move through the chyme that was made in the stomach. So food can last, can stay and hang out in the stomach anywhere between two to six hours, right? And it varies. It depends on one, how much food is you're, you've emptied into the stomach, and two, how much food is actually in the small and large intestines. This is all based on reflexes now, right? So it varies here, all right, two to six hours. Now, in the stomach, when we start the breakdown of food, not a lot of digestion or, excuse me, not a lot of absorption occurs in the stomach, all right? The main job for the stomach is to hold on to food and get it ready for the small intestine. The small intestine is where you're going to see most of the absorption. So the only things that are really going to be digested or, excuse me, absorbed in the, in the, in the stomach are going to be, bless you, uh, items that are really small and nonpolar. Well, guess what? We've seen those characteristics before, all right, for things to move across the plasma membrane directly. All right, they can diffuse directly through the plasma membrane. All right, they had to be small and nonpolar. Similar situation here. All right, when we're dealing with the stomach, okay, for absorption, it's going to be those same characteristics. Small and nonpolar items will cross over, all right, those cells there, okay? So a couple of things that we saw uh, in the lab, just to review, okay? Think of the stomach, all right, as this J-shaped structure, Okay. Oh, that's horrible. Okay. Anyways, on the smaller area here, okay, the, con the, the concave area, that is going to be your lesser curvature. Okay. It's adjacent here to the esophagus. This is the esophagus, by the way. All right. Then our larger uh, curvature is going to be the greater curvature, and that's this whole region here. And I really probably shouldn't have to review this with you because you are already took the lab exam. By the way, and I know that not everybody was here and not everybody was online at home, you all did really good. I was really happy. Very, very happy. Okay. Um, there's four regions to our stomach. The first region right here, right by the esophagus closest to the heart, is the cardia. That's where food will enter in immediately. And then we've got our other region here, the dome-like region. That's the fundus. Okay. Then our largest region of the stomach is this region right here, okay? That's going to be the body. And then where my drawing was better, okay, where the stomach kind of uh, funnels into like a tube, like a, a funnel-shaped area, this region right here, that's going to be the pylorus region, okay? So keep in mind, all right, we go from kind of a smaller area in the superior portion of the stomach to a very big area in the body and then back down to a smaller region here in the pylorus. Again, some of the structural uh, characteristics of the stomach is that it has those folds there, the gastric folds that we call rugae, all right? So when the stomach is empty, you'll see those rugae relatively prominent. When you load in a bunch of food products in there and liquid, all right, it'll distend the stomach and those rugae will flatten out. Okay. 
As we move towards the far end of the stomach, towards the duodenum, that's the pylorus area there, right? And so that opening between the duodenum and the, and the stomach is that pyloric orifice in which we have the pyloric sphincter there. Now, the sphincter operates on a pressure gradient system, meaning as we're getting more material building up in the stomach, that's going to put more pressure on that sphincter, which will, again, stimulate a reflex. That reflex will allow that sphincter to relax, and it'll open up, and it'll allow the movement of chyme into the duodenum. Okay? When that pressure starts to fall, all right, then that pyloric sphincter will squeeze shut, and it'll prevent the passage of chyme from the stomach into the duodenum. Because we don't want to push a lot of material out of the stomach into the duodenum. We can't give it any more than it can handle. Okay, it's a very controlled process here, all right? So we don't want to overdo it, okay? Here are those gastric folds, the rugae here, pretty much what I was just talking about, okay? When the stomach is empty, you can see them quite prominently. When it is filled, they pretty much stretch out and go away, okay? We talked about the two serous membranes, the greater and the lesser momentum before. All right, so I do want to talk about the gastric pit and glands. There's about five different secretions that are gonna be um, produced here, all right, in the stomach, okay? Some of those secretions will help with the digestion, all right? Some of those secretions are gonna involve hormones, all right? And some of those secretions are gonna involve the production of mucus, okay, which will help to, uh, protect, all right, the epithelial lining here. So if you look here on this diagram here, you can see that the stomach is lined by epithelial tissue, okay? And throughout, the, the whole interior of the stomach, you'll have these big pits here. These are called gastric pits. And at the bottom, you're going to have the gastric gland. This is going to be the secretory portion. I mean, all these cells will produce something, right? But the majority of the cells that line, all right, the inside of the stomach, all right, and the superior portion of the gastric pit are going to be these mucus cells, okay? So they're going to produce the alkaline mucus, all right? So understand that the majority of the secretions of the stomach are going to have a low pH. What does that mean? That means they're going to be more acidic, okay? So we're going to produce a mucus that's going to have more of an alkaline content or a basic content to help to neutralize, all right, those stomach secretions, okay? Because we don't want to damage the tissue, all right? And again, I talked about this before when we talk about stomach ulcers, all right? A lot of stomach ulcers are a result of a bacteria called H. pylori, right? And this bacteria can damage the tissue, expose that tissue, where the acidic gastric secretions then can further damage that tissue. So if you give them the proper medication, destroy the bacteria, take away the cause, then you can decrease stomach ulcerations that way. So as we move further down into the gastric pit here around the neck, we call it, Okay, we see a different kind of mucus gland, all right? This type of mucus gland produces the acidic type of mu uh, mucus, okay? Now, uh, that acidic mucus will help to propagate the hydrochloric acid, all right, that our parietal cells are going to produce, all right? It's the, the hydrochloric acid, which is going to do a lot of heavy lifting here in a moment. So as we get down here now into the glandular portion, all right, of this large crypt here or pit, we see our first cell here called the parietal cell. It produces HCl, hydrochloric acid, okay, and intrinsic factor. Now intrinsic factor, all right, is important because it allows us to absorb vitamin B12, Right, in the ileum, that's the third part of your small intestine. And we need, does anyone know what we need vitamin B12 for? So we can make properly functioning erythrocytes, red blood cells. Okay, so we need that. So it gets produced here in the stomach and it gets secreted, all right, out into the gastric secretions. Okay, so the parietal cell is what is going to produce that intrinsic factor. And we need that to help absorb vitamin B12. We need vitamin B12, all right, for the proper production and creation of erythrocytes. 
You know who's lacking in vitamin B12? Vegans, people that are on a, a highly restrictive diet that does not involve red meat at all. all right? There's a significant amount of vitamin B12 in red meat. So vegans, and depending on how well some uh, people, if they have restrictive diets, how well they manage their, their dietary intake, they might have to get vitamin B12 shots. Okay. All right, the next cell that we see further down, these are the chief cells, okay? And they produce pepsinogen, which is an inactive enzyme. And we're going to find out that a lot of these enzymes that these cells produce, the cell itself has to make these enzymes inactive, all right? Because if they're active and they're producing it inside the cell, some of these enzymes are what we call proteases, and proteases are a classification of enzymes that break down proteins. Well, you've got proteins on the inside of the cell, and if those proteases are active inside the cell, they can start to destroy the proteins inside the cell, and that's bad news. So this pepsinogen is an inactivated enzyme, okay, that becomes activated outside of the cell. And then we have gastric lipase. Well, if you look at lipase, think of lipids, think of an enzyme that's going to help to break down fats. And then finally, all right, we've got our G cell way at the bottom, which is good because that's going to be closest to the blood vessels down here, all right, because the secretions of the G cell don't go into the gastric gland and out here into the stomach. They go into the bloodstream. This type of cell is in a classification of cells called enteroendocrine cells, which means that these cells just make hormones, okay? And it's going to produce gastrin, and it's going to uh, – uh, secrete that gastrin into our bloodstream. And we'll talk about what gastrin is going to do. It helps to promote more gastric secretions all right, and motility here. All right, so let me run through these real fast here for you. All right, so we have five types of cells. Four of them are going to make what we call the gastric juice secretions that's getting dumped into your stomach. All right, the fifth makes that hormone, those G cells, which make the gastrin, okay? So the surface mucus cells, all right, create that alkaline product there, okay, that is going to help prevent ulceration of the stomach lining, okay, because of that high acid content from the parietal cells of the hydrochloric acid. All right, hydrochloric acid has a pH close to one, all right, that's pretty acidic, all right, pH scale goes from one to 14, seven is neutral, 14 is very basic, all right, one is very acidic. Okay, so again, these cells, all right, make up a majority, all right, of the cells that line the stomach, and they're constantly producing this mucus, constantly. All right, the next one are the mucus next cells. These are the ones that make that acidic mucin, mucin, all right, that is going to promote the acidic environment, okay, but keep in mind, we call these mucus cells for a reason. Remember, the number one, what I said at the beginning of, the, of today's lecture, mucus is number one. Our main job is to lubricate, okay? It is going to lubricate, right? So we don't damage, prevents abrasion and injury to those tissues, all right, throughout the digestive tract. All right, questions so far? Not too bad. Am I going too slow? All right, I don't want to bore you. All right. Then we've got our parietal cells, right, that are going to make both the intrinsic factor and the hydrochloric acid, okay? So we'll hit more when we get into the small intestine on intrinsic factor, but for right now, know that it is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12 in the ileum, that is the distal part, the last part of the small intestine, all right? And we need that B12 for the production of normal red blood cells there, okay? Hydrochloric acid. And we're going to talk about how it is actually made. And you're somewhat familiar with it because if you remember when we were talking about the respiratory system and how carbon dioxide likes to travel in your blood, okay, remember that term, the chloride shift, all right, in which carbon dioxide will enter into a red blood cell and it'll attach itself onto, well, not onto, but it'll um, break down, it'll combine with water into bicarbonate and the hydrogen ion, that hydrogen ion will attach onto the hemoglobin. That bicarbonate leaves the red blood cell. As it leaves the red blood cell, a chloride ion moves into the red blood cell, and that's called the chloride shift. All right, where well, we're going to talk about something similar that involves that, all right, here in a moment. 
Okay, but keep in mind, all right, that hydrochloric acid is not made in the parietal cell. Okay, it's just going to provide the ingredients for that. All right, because if it made hydrochloric acid inside the parietal cell, that cell's doomed. All right, it would destroy itself. Okay. Okay. So keep in mind, what do we need hydrochloric acid for? Yeah, it's going to break things down, but big time, all right, acidic conditions, and that was one of the things we talked about when we talked about that blood pH value of 7.4, all right, and the reason why we want to keep it, all right, slightly on the basic side is because when you're in acidic conditions, all right, it causes the denaturation of proteins. What is that? You break the proteins down. That's what happens. So that's what happens here with the hydrochloric acid. It's going to break the proteins down, okay? And some um, things that you ingest are a lot harder to break down than others. For example, all right, when you take in things that we call fiber, for example, all right, certain things you can't digest, all right, like corn kernels, the lining of the corn kernels, your body can't break that down because of the plant cell wall, right? So we don't have the proper uh, enzymes to break that down. So what happens? You're going to pass it through your GI tract, and we call it fiber. All right? The hydrochloric acid will help to break down some of those components, but it can only do so much. Okay? Also, this is huge, all right? hydrochloric acid will activate pepsinogen into peptin. All right? Pepsin is actually an enzyme that breaks down proteins. Cool to know. That's going to be helpful because we need to start getting these proteins broken down. And then finally, all right, when you're eating food, all right, sometimes you will take in some microorganisms, okay? Viruses, bacteria, mainly bacteria. Well, the acidic conditions help to kill those microorganisms. Kind of cool, okay? So this next slide here. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about how we make hydrochloric acid real fast, okay? The parietal cell is not going to make the hydrochloric acid in, inside of itself. It's just going to provide us with the ingredients. All right, so here's what we're looking at. You've got water inside the cell, as you do in most cells. Here's what happens in the parietal cell, all right? And you learned this back in Chapter 2, okay? Water will spontaneously disassociate. I'm not saying that happens here, but when water spontaneously disassociates, you get one hydrogen ion and you get a peroxide ion. All right? That's what happens all right, when we talked about in chapter two about acids and bases. Well, in the parietal cell, water is broken down into a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. Well, cool. We're going to get rid of that hydrogen ion. We're going to pump that out of the cell into the lumen here of the gastric gland. We've got this special pump, which is perfect because it's going to export hydrogen. Well, at the same time, it's going to bring in potassium. And we already know that there's more potassium inside our cells than outside the cells. So that works out well. We saw a similar mechanism in the thyroid gland, all right, in Chapter 17, all right, when we were talking about how iodine, all right, enters into the follicular cells, all right, iodine will enter in and sodium got exported out. Okay, so very similar mechanism here. So now we have one part of our ingredient, all right? Our hydrogen ion is sitting out here in the lumen. All right, well, we need the chloride, okay? No problem. So that hydroxide ion, right, is going to combine with carbon dioxide. All right, that's a cell waste, respiratory gas. No problem, we got plenty of that lying around. And guess what? Bam, bicarbonate. You guys are familiar with bicarbonate, all right? It's a buffer, okay? So the parietal cell kicks the bicarbonate out into the bloodstream. By doing that, all right, it actually takes the chloride that's either in the blood, all right, where most of it will be found, and it'll actually exchange that bicarbonate with the chlorine. And it comes into the parietal cell, and then the parietal cell exports it right out of the cell into the lumen, where it combines with the hydrogen to form hydrochloric acid. Boom. That's all it is. Okay? So think of the parietal cell like a matchmaker. All right? You've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match? This is what's happening here. The parietal cell is going to match up the hydrogen ion with the chloride ion to make hydrochloric acid. And that's what it does. It grabs those ingredients and it produces them right there in the lumen. 
okay? While at the same time, it provides bicarbonate for our blood. Cool, it's a buffer. I like it. I like buffering. It keeps my pH levels in a nice normal level or a happy level in our circulatory system. Okay, gastric secretions continued. Chief cells. Chief cells produce two, two, all right, uh, enzymes. Okay, the first one is an inactive enzyme, the pepsinogen. Okay, we're gonna use pepsinogen. All right, we're gonna excrete it out into the lumen where it'll be activated by two things. All right, it's either activated by hydrochloric acid and the pepsin, and then that pepsin is gonna break down proteins, or another pepsin, all right, molecule can activate a pepsinogen molecule. All right, so that's kind of helpful, right? But important thing, what is its purpose? It's a protease. It will break down proteins, okay? And then the other product that is produced by the chief cells are the gastric lipase, all right? And it's an enzyme that will break down our fats, all right? Not a lot, but we start breaking down the fats, only about 10 to 15%, all right, is going to be undergoing that uh, catabolic uh, metabolism. Okay, we're gonna to start to break that down in the stomach. Questions so far? Not too bad? I'm not hurting anybody's brain? Mm. Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. I don't know what that song is. Is that Rick Roll? I don't know. All right. Last cell. And this is our endocrine cell. All right. This is that cell that is going to produce the gastrin hormone all right, into the bloodstream, which will cause an increase in secretions of the stomach and an increase in the motility of the stomach. Remember, your stomach is gonna do two things, okay? Well, when we're talking about uh, the, the uh, motility of the stomach, one, it's gonna mix food up, it's gonna churn the food around, or should, excuse me, not the food, all right? The chyme, it's going to churn the chyme Mix it up, mix those gastric secretions in there, and it's going to move, all right, that chyme out of the stomach and into the duodenum. Remember, there's three layers of muscle tissue all right, in the stomach, different than what we saw before. Most of the time, we see two layers, all right, a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. The circular layer is the one that's responsible for the churning and mixing of the food, and the longitudinal layer is usually the layer that helps to move the food through the digestive tract, okay? Well, your stomach has three layers, so it helps to really shake things up, really mix things around, all right? That's its big job here. Now, there are other enteroendocrine cells in here, all right, that will produce um, some of the different types. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, substance P is just different types of of endocrine productions, all right? For example, somatostatin. You guys remember what somatostatin was? It's growth hormone inhibiting factor. It actually, you know, decreases the amount of growth hormone production. So there are other cells, all right, in the stomach that are going to have, all right, uh, en endocrine roles, but we're just not gonna talk about them. We're only gonna talk about the ones that are actually pertinent to the digestive system here, okay? So you can see here in this diagram, all right, our surface mucus cells, they're going to be producing all that alkaline mucus to protect the inside lane, uh, uh, lining here. Then we also have the mucus neck cells, which will produce a little bit, all right, of that acidic type of mucus. Okay, but again, mucus nonetheless, all right, chief cells are going to produce that pepsinogen, which is going to get activated by the hydrochloric acid, which helps to break down, all right, those proteins all right, into smaller proteins, okay? We need something that's big, we need to make it smaller, and that's what we're gonna to start to do. All right, that pepsinogen gets converted into pepsin, which will activate itself, all right? Or not itself, but activate other pepsinogens, all right, with the help of hydrochloric acid, okay? Then we've got our, uh, the prydocell is also gonna produce that intrinsic factor, and then we've got our chief cell, which is gonna produce the pepsinogen and the gastric lipase. All right, and then finally, our G cells are producing gastrin, but not into the lumen here, but into our bloodstream here. Okay, so like I was saying, when the stomach, all right, its job is to hold things, 
all right? And it's just not going to hold things and not do anything with it, all right? So during that period of holding, all right, we start to convert that bolus, which is still relatively solid, into more of a liquidy type, all right, of material. And we do that through that gastric mixing here, all right, which is still a mechanical digestion because we're physically taking something that was in larger blocks and, in, and we're breaking it down into smaller parts. But at that time, we are converting it from the bolus into the chyme here, okay? So as this is going on, okay, the stomach, all right, is going to be stimulated through a bunch of different reflexes. And we're going to talk about some of those here in a few moments. All right, but in itself, the stomach can actually trigger some of its own reflexes as you start to fill up the stomach and more chyme accumulates, it's going to put more pressure, all right, on our pyloric sphincter there, okay? And as it does that, all right, we increase that pressure gradient there, the sphincter will open up and it will release a small amount of chyme into the duodenum which will trigger another type of reflex here that we're going to talk about in a moment, the intestinal reflex, all right? So as this is going on and it's releasing some of that chyme into the duodenum, all right, as the pressure gradient falls, all right, that will trigger the closing of the sphincter. And as that occurs, all right, even though that material is still getting pushed towards the sphincter, it's pushing it against a closed orifice, and it causes what we call retropulsion, which is like a backward kind of mixing pattern. Point being is we're just mixing, 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 all right? First thing you should think about the stomach is that it's a mixing bowl with a lot of secretion going on, okay? That's what we're, we're going to see here, okay? So this picture here you can see, all right? Here we're swallowing some food, all right? That bolus end, ends up here in the stomach, all right? We start to fill the stomach up causes baroreceptors to stretch and stimulate the muscles to contract. That contraction of all those muscles here starts to mix the food products here, okay, in addition to secretions from the gastric glands. Everything's getting mixed. It gets pushed towards the pylorus here and against the pyloric sphincter, all right, as that pressure gradient builds up, all right, some of the chyme is ejected into the duodenum. So as some of that chyme is leaving, the pressure gradient drops, all right, which triggers the pyloric sphincter to close. And as it closes, it causes this retropulsion here, all right, as that chyme kind of backflows in on itself, causing more mixing. Okay, we're just mixing th things up here. Okay. So we saw in the heart, you know, how we had a set of cells, okay, that helped to stimulate the heart rates, we call those pacemaker cells. Well, we have a similar set here, all right, in our GI tract. And we have pacemaker cells, all right, that are gonna do the same thing. They're going to spontaneously depolarize. Pacemaker cells in the heart do it, so why can't the pacemaker cells in the stomach, all right? And what will happen is that it will allow, again, that mixing pattern to occur and create kind of like a slight rhythm with the muscular contraction going on here, right? And at the same time, all right, it'll also stimulate gastric gland secretion, okay? So as this is all going on here, all right, remember, think the digestive system. It's one big reflex occurring, all right? In order for us to move things from one end to the other, all right, we have to set up a stimulus, all right? And some of that stimulus is the presence of food in the stomach here, all right? So when we see, all right, these pacemaker cells, all right, when they're spontaneously depolarizing, they're going to help regulate the movement of that food from the stomach into the duodenum. And part of that has to do with, all right, it's not always based on just how much is in there because your stomach's not always full and it's not always empty. Okay, but you will have certain situations in which, all right, as material leaves the duodenum and parts of the small intestine, all right, these pacemaker cells will help to pull, uh, depolarize, excuse me, all right, those muscle cells, those smooth muscle cells to move items from the stomach into the small intestine. So when we talk about these reflexes, we're going to talk about the three phases here. 
okay? The cephalic, the gastric, and intestinal phases here of our gastric reflexes. All right, if you look at the names here, they're pretty much going to tell you where it's involving, all right? Intestinal, think of the intestines, small intestine. Gastric, think of the stomach, all right? Cephalic, all right? Cephalad, head, okay? It's all in your head. And so we're going to talk about now how these um, phases here, all right? how that's going to influence, one, the force of contraction of those smooth muscles, all right, in the areas that we're going to discuss, and also what the glands are doing, okay? So let's jump here into the cephalic phase, okay? This one here, I think it's cool. Just by thinking of food, and it's all happened to us before, right? You're talking to somebody, they're telling you what they had for dinner last night, you haven't eaten all morning long, you're listening to what they're ha they have for dinner, you're like, oh, that sounds good. Next thing you know, you know, your mouth is watering. All right, you smell food, you see food. If you're looking through a food magazine, all right, that's what it's based on. Food advertising on TV, they're actually trying to take full advantage of the cephalic phase. So when you're watching a Taco Bell commercial, if that's your thing or whatever, and you see something that looks really good, and you're like, man, I'm hungry. They've gotten you to engage in the cephalic phase. Okay, so it involves the higher area or higher order areas of your brain, your cerebral cortex, depending on what you're doing. If you see a commercial on TV, that's going to stimulate the occipital lobe, all right? If you smell something, all right, that's going to stimulate the temporal lobe. If you taste something, that's going to stimulate, which lobe am I leaving out for taste? Y'all remember? The hidden lobe? The insula, okay? The insula. Anyways, so those lobes will then transmit information, okay, to, well, let's, we can't leave out the limbic system, all right, so you can have an emotional response, but all of that, all right, is eventually going to wind up at the medulla oblongata, okay, and the medulla oblongata will then start to stimulate, okay, the stomach, okay, it's already started, your brainstem has already started to stimulate your mouth, all right, because Cranial nerve seven and nine, all right, facial and glossopharyngeal have already started the secretions from your saliva glands, okay? Mouth's getting ready to have something to eat, all right? Well, we got to get the stomach ready. So the cranial nerve that's going to prepare the stomach, vagus, cranial nerve number 10, okay? So it starts to kind of start up the machinery. Let's start cranking up the machinery. So we're going to start to increase the motility of the muscles in the stomach, and we're going to start to see the glands secrete, all right, their um, enzymes, okay, hydrochloric acid, all that fun stuff is going to start to be secreted. So it's not uncommon, and I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced this, this is when, all right, your stomach will start to growl. Guess what? Welcome to the cephalic phase, okay? So now you're eating food, yum, 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 okay? And you're swallowing it down. We've already covered that, the whole swallowing process. And that bolus starts to travel down the esophagus, and it enters into the stomach. Welcome to the gastric phase, okay? The gastric phase here, okay, we are going to start to move food, all right, through the upper GI tract into the stomach, all right? We start to fill the stomach up. Well, guess what? That's going to stimulate the baroreceptors. They monitor the stretch on the stomach wall. Okay, that's good, because guess what? When we, monitor, when we start to increase the stretch on the gastric wall, then that sensory information gets sent back up to the brainstem, to the medulla oblongata, and the medulla oblongata, then it will stimulate the vagus nerve to increase secretions, increase stomach motility, all right? So we're now going to see, all right, the baroreceptors, all right, are going to be involved with stretch. Our chemoreceptors, all right, chemicals in the stomach involving an increase in pH, all right, and protein presence, okay? Now we've got both of those receptors stimulating the medulla oblongata to increase our stomach motility and increase the gland secretion. Kind of see what we're looking at here, all right? So that's, again, a whole reflex arc that we're seeing. All right, still in the gastric phase because I didn't mention this and I should have. All right, when we're dealing with the gastric phase, it's regulated through the gastric reflex, which is what I just talked about, all right, chemoreceptors and baroreceptors, but also the release of gastrin, a hormone, 
Okay, so if this type of reflex, right, or phase is under the influence of both neurological activity and hormonal activity. Okay, so you're seeing an example in which the nervous system and the endocrine system are, are involved here, okay, in the digestive process. Okay, so I just talked about the uh, nervous system, all right, part of it. Here's the endocrine part, okay? We release the gastrin, okay, because we've increased per, uh, uh, the presence of proteins, carbohydrates, fats into the stomach, all right, but especially the proteins there, all right? And what we'll see now as the G cells produce the gastrin, okay, it'll enter into the circulatory system and head back to the stomach, and it'll increase more contraction and more gastric secretion. And as this is occurring, all right, the gastrin will also prevent, all right, the release of the chyme, okay, as frequently, so it will actually stimulate the pyloric sphincter, all right, to stay closed longer. So it'll slow stomach emptying, especially if more food is entering into the stomach. All right, questions on that so far? Not too bad? All right, let's hit the last phase now, the intestinal phase, okay? All right, so intestinal phase, all right? This is what's going to occur, all right, when we exit chyme from the stomach into the small intestine, okay? So with the intestinal reflex, again, it's another reflex, all right? This type of, in, in this phase, all right, we're going to see, all right, something different than what we saw in the previous two phases, Okay, that's why we said the intestinal phase all right, opposes all right, the cephalic and the gastric phase. Because in the intestinal phase, all right, in the cephalic all right, and in the, in the gastric phase, we saw an increase in motility. We saw an increase in stomach production for the digestive enzymes. Well, guess what? In the intestinal phase, we're going to see a decrease. We're going to decrease the motility, all right, and we're going to decrease the secretions in the stomach here, okay? So that is also going to be based on the nervous system and the endocrine system, all right? We'll talk about that in a second here, all right? So when we get into the endocrine portion of this, because with the endocrine system, we have these two new hormones that we haven't talked about, CCK, cholecystokinin, and secretin, okay? And both of these, are going to decrease the stomach motility and the secretions of the stomach glands there, all right, which will also slow the emptying of the stomach. Now, CCK does a couple other things, and we'll, we'll, we'll hit that. It helps with causing the, the uh, gallbladder and the pancreas to contract and, and excrete their digestive enzymes. It also relaxes the ileocecal valve. We'll hit that. CCK play, plays a pretty big role. But right now, all right, cholecystokinin and secretin are going to start to slow things down, okay? Slow the emptying of the stomach, decrease the motility of the stomach, decrease the secretions of the stomach, okay? Because we'll start to see as the, as the stomach starts to empty, all right, more of the contents are in this small intestine now. So we can kind of turn the stomach off. We don't need you anymore. We don't need you making all your stuff, all right? You can do that later, the next time we eat, okay? So I love these pictures here in your book, figure 2614. All right, this breaks it down nicely, and I'm just going to kind of quickly go over this, but I just already kind of spent some time here. All right, so the cephalic phase, you smell something nice, you see something nice, stimulates the cerebral cortex. That will then transmit information to the hypothalamus, but then it will transmit its information to the medulla oblongata, all right, where your digestive centers are. That will then stimulate via the vagus nerve an increase in secretions, and we start to increase the motility. The muscle starts. We start. We start up the equipment. All right, we're starting. We're cranking her up. 
getting ready for food to get in there, okay? So we move into the gastric phase. Now we're starting to eat. Food is starting to enter into the stomach here, all right? As food enters in, all right, as the bolus enters in, all right, puts stretch on the stomach wall, stimulates baroreceptors. The physical presence of that bolus there, all right, is going to stimulate the chemoreceptors depending on what type of food it is. If it's a protein, fat, all right, if it's a carbohydrate, all right, all that is going to send sensory innervation information up to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata will then respond to that and increase the nervous output along the vagus nerve to, again, increase the force of contractions, mix that food up, increase secretions, mix it up with some of those digestive enzymes, getting it ready, all right, getting it ready to push here into, all right, our small intestine, into the duodenum, okay? Pressure and gradient hasn't built up yet. And while that's going on, gastrin is also being produced, going into the bloodstream, circulating back to the stomach, reinforcing the increase in the force of contractions, reinforcing the increase in secretions. Cool. Then that leads us to the intestinal phase. All right, now we're emptying the food into the duodenum. That, excuse me, the chyme. Chyme enters into the duodenum. All right, as it leaves the stomach, that decreases the stretch on the stomach walls, decreases the baroreceptor input, okay? Since there's no more food in the stomach, that's going to decrease the chemoreceptive input, okay? So we decrease all that input going up to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata then is no longer going to stimulate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is no longer going to uh, cause the muscles to contract. It's not going to cause all right, the glands to secrete any more of their digestive enzymes, or at the same time, all right, in our small intestine, all right, we see the production of cholecystokinin and secretin. Both of those hormones are also going to prevent the stomach from contracting, to decrease the force of contractions, to decrease the gastric uh, enzyme output, okay? So we're seeing both a neurological and an endocrine response to that. Okay, all that will occur in the intestinal phase. So in the intestinal phase, we're starting to ramp things down in the stomach. It's okay, job is done. All right, now we're going to move on to the next area, all right, of the digestive tract, and that'll be our small intestine. We don't need you anymore, so we don't have to worry about you doing all your stuff. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to our lower GI tract. Now remember, the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, is considered part of the upper GI tract. We're going to talk about that. All right? But I want to do a quick overview here of what's in store for us. It's like, you know, tune in to see what's on next week's episode. Now we're going to talk about, all right, what we're going to see, all right, in the lower GI tract. Okay? So lower GI tract, okay, it's going to be the small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum, the anus, okay? So pretty much here, all right, we're going to see a considerable amount of digestion and absorption occurring there. A lot of occurs in the duodenum, don't get me wrong. All right, the small intestine, that's where we're going to see most of the chemical digestion and absorption taking place, okay? We'll still see that in the large intestine too, okay? But in the large intestine, now we're going to see, all right, more undigestible food product, all right, or unabsorbable material moving into that area. So we've got to get rid of that stuff. So we're going to prepare, all right, that stuff for elimination, okay? All right, so the small intestine, three parts, duodenum, all right, jejunum, and the ileum, okay? So this is where that chyme is going to enter into, and this is key, you need to know this. Most of the chemical digestion and absorption will occur here in the small intestine. All right, that's key. That's why it's so long. Small intestine is huge. Um, I've mentioned this before, not in this class, but if you, were to, you take out the small intestine out of somebody and if you were to stretch out its entire surface area, and I'm including the microvilli on all of those columnar epithelial cells, the surface area of the small intestine is as big as a tennis court. That's huge, and that's in your body, okay? That's in each and every one of us, 
of a tennis court. If you've ever played tennis, you know what I'm talking about. It's a lot. So that's a large surface area to digest things. All right? Here in the duodenum, this first part, that's where we're going to see a lot of our accessory organs dumping their secretions into. The liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas. Those are our accessory digestive organs. We're going to talk about some of that stuff. All right? So you can see here, all right, bile from the liver stored and concentrated and upgraded in the gallbladder, okay? And then we got the pancreas, which is going to create its pancreatic juice, which are all these delicious enzymes that are going to help to break down. Uh, I want to meet the creep that stretched out. <laughs> yeah, his name was Jack the Ripper. <laughs> No, I know, I know. It's that's a scientist thing. Those people, they got nothing better to do. Um, all right, so here we're going to see, all right, pretty much the production of the bile and these pancreatic juices here, which you're, we're going to talk about the importance of those in how they uh, help to break down. All right, they're mainly involved in that chemical digestion. Okay, large intestine primarily is going to absorb water. This is where we're going to start. Remember, because chyme is relatively liquidy, all right? And, and, and um, ideally, all right, when you have a bowel movement, you don't want it to be uh, liquidy. You want it to be more of a, on a solid or semi-solid uh, um, uh, spectrum there, okay? So here in the large intestine, this is where we're going to absorb a lot of the water, all right, out of the food product there, out of the chyme. All right. Also, our electrolytes and our vitamins, uh, water-soluble, fat-soluble vitamins, here, uh, vitamins. But this is where we are going to start to make our feces here to be eliminated through the final part of the digestive tract, which is the anus. Okay. We'll get into this all in much more detail. All right. Because I'm going to go through this and kind of break it down. All right. So let's start off, okay, with the small intestine and walk ourselves through it a little bit. Some of this you've already seen, all right? So the small intestine is the next part of the digestive tract after the stomach, okay? So it is gonna be in the central region of your abdomen, all right? So we'll see it more in the middle portion here. It'll be below the stomach, but mostly in the central portion of your abdomen here, all right? So the food product, the chyme, is going to spend close to 12 hours, okay? So what time is it now? Seven? So if you were up at 7 o'clock this morning and you had breakfast or some food or at 6, all right, that food is still in, well, if you give it two to six hours of holding time in the stomach, all right, that food is most likely still in your small intestine. It's still in you, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, so here, all right, this is where we're going to see most, not all, but most of the nutrients are going to be absorbed here. Well, at the same time, it's still going to be absorbing water, all right, electrolytes. If you don't remember what electrolytes are, there are any type of element that can conduct electricity, all right, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, all those important uh, items that we've been studying, all right, in this course, okay. We're going to see a lot of... Uh, absorption of those elements, those electrolytes, those vitamins here in the small intestine. All right, so I want to walk through each part, all right, of the small intestine. We'll start off with the duodenum here, okay? So basically, the duodenum, all right, starts at the pyloric sphincter, okay? And it literally, I can't draw it very well, but it is like a C-shaped, all right, kind of structure like that. So here's the pylorics, or the pylorus, I should say, of the stomach. Okay, so it's like a C-shaped component here. Okay, and here in the uh, duodenum is where we're going to get the secretions from our accessory organs. All right, not only is it going to receive the chyme. But now it's going to get the pancreatic juices from the pancreas, all right, and the bile from the gallbladder and liver, okay? So now we're going to start pouring in these digestive juices, all right, and these secretions to help really start to break down that food product in the chyme, all right? So we can really undergo the huge amounts of 
chemical digestion here, okay? So the majority of the uh, duodenum is going to be retroperitoneal. Okay, there's four parts. So this first part here is going to be contiguous with the stomach. So the stomach is intraperitoneal. So the first part of the duodenum is going to be intraperitoneal. All right, the remaining three segments of the duodenum are going to be retroperitoneal. Okay, it's the only part of the small intestine that's retroperitoneal. All right, the jejunum and the ileum are both intraperitoneal. Okay. All right, the next portion is the jejunum, all right, it's two-fifths of the small intestine. Again, we'll see chemical digestion and nutrient absorption occurring here, all right? This area is intraperitoneal, all right, and it's suspended by the mesentery proper. What's the mesentery proper? That's that tissue I was telling you about that is attached to the posterior abdominal wall. Helps to anchor, all right, the small intestine, prevents it from just running all over the place, slipping and sliding everywhere, okay? So that is going to be the jejunum. That's the middle portion of the small intestine. The last part, okay, is the ileum, okay? This makes up the majority. It is three-fifths of the small intestine. At the very end of the ileum is our ileocecal valve, okay? So this is that sphincter that is going to control the passage of chyme from the small intestine into the cecum. All right, that first part of the large intestine, okay? It too is intraperitoneal, all right? But its main function is absorption, okay? So you can see here, all right, the entire length of that small intestine is going to be for absorption purposes, chemical digestion and absorption, all right? A lot happens there. <clears throat> Does anyone remember the name of the folds inside the small intestine? Remember those little ridges, those circular folds on the inside? I know some of you may have had it for a test question. Plique what? Plique circularis? Does that sound familiar? No. <laughs> well, then you didn't have it on your test. I mean, it's probably a good thing you didn't. <laughs> okay, okay. Plica, plique. Um, Oh, I know. I hope I never in my career. <laughs> I'm going to have to. Trust me. Just remember how it's supposed to be spelled. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like, uh, perfect example, duodenum. All right. I pronounce it duodenum, but apparently in Canada and in England, they call it duodenum. Yeah. Du and that's fine. I mean, again, like vitamin and vitamin, capillary, capillary. I mean, it's just different. Whatever works. If it helps you. Yeah. Um, so here, those plique circularis, all right, those are the speed bumps of the inside of the small intestine, okay? So keep in mind, for a movement of the small intestine, they call it segmentation there, all right? And we'll talk about, there's, per, there's peristalsis, the actual advancement of the chyme and the food material throughout the small intestine. Then you have segmentation where it just kind of sloshes things back and forth, kind of like, in your, in your uh, clothes washing machine, right? When the machine just spins back and forth, right? And it tries to agitate, all right, soiled clothes. Well, here, all right, these circular folds, these plique circularics, yes, they act as speed bumps here, but what they also do is to really help increase the surface area there for absorption. Because this stuff is getting moved back and forth across those ridges there, all right, it's exposing whatever that material is, all right, to more tissue, all right, helps to increase that surface absorption area too, okay? So as we go throughout the small intestine, we see a lot of them in the duodenum or duodenum, all right, and then they start to decrease when we get to the ileum, okay? So we see a lot in the duodenum, all right, and then we see little, little in the ileum. Now that changes when we talk about goblet cells, which are the mucin-producing cells, all right, in the small intestine. That's different as we get further through, all right, the small intestine, as we go from the duodenum to the ileum, we see more and more of those types of cells. So it's kind of a inverted relationship here, okay? So here's a picture 
all right, of the plique circularis here, all right, these little speed bumps, okay? So again, it helps to increase the surface area in addition to the columnar cells that have the microvilli, which also increases the surface area. So it's really impressive just how much surface area all right, is made available all right, for the absorption in the chemical digestion process there. Okay, so in the small intestine, okay, much like the stomach, it is going to secrete things. It's gonna make its own secretions. Some of those secretions all right, are going to help for chemical digestion also. Okay, and we'll get into that in much more detail when we talk about the individual macromolecules here, okay? But in the small intestine, okay, we have these structures, all right, that we call the intestinal villi. And we talked about those in lab. And they're just these big, huge invaginations of the mucosa, okay? All right, so we'll see, all right, in these in intestinal glands, all right, at the bottom, you'll see, uh, why am I drawing it? I'll just show it to you. All right, so here you can see an intestinal villi here, and at the base here, all right, you'll see these glands here, all right, and these glands are going to secrete, and we'll talk about some of the, uh, some of the things that they secrete, all right, but in the intestinal villi, we'll see obviously epithelial tissues, but these guys, goblet cells, we talked about them, the unicellular gland that helps to produce that mucin which again, like I said, you can never have too much mucus. And so it's those goblet cells that give us that mucus there, okay? So it produces that mucus. Once it mixes with water, it makes mucus, okay? Which is great. We love it because time comes with water, all right? So it helps with that. What else are we gonna find, all right, for the small intestine secretions? All right, we're gonna have our unicellular gland cells, which makes, ooh, enteropeptidase. All right, yummy, that's a delicious enzyme that is going to help with breaking down some of our proteins. Again, proteins are a pain in the butt, so we need some help, all right? In addition to that, we've got our enteroendocrine cells, all right? Remember, you heard me talking about CCK in, in secretin, cholecystokinin and secretin, all right? This is where they live, okay? So during the intestinal phase, as food is getting dumped into, all right, the duodenum, these cells here are going to be the cells that are going to be stimulated to release the cholecystokinin, all right, and the secretin, which are going to decrease stomach motility, decrease the gland secretion of the stomach cells. And we're going to talk about in a moment what some of these hormones are going to do now in the small intestine, all right? And then, of course, because chyme is acidic, all right, we've got our submucosal glands, that make the alkaline mucus here, okay? So we've got to protect our tissue, and we've done that right here with our submucosal gland. All right, so to kind of give you a little bit of a perspective of where all these glands are, all right, the intestinal villi here are pretty much going to be the epithelium, our microvilli cells, all right, with the simple columnar epithelium, all right, they're going to be doing a lot of the absorption here, all right, and then we have plenty of goblet cells found scattered throughout, okay? And then when we get in here into our gland down here at the bottom, all right, this is where we're going to run into, all right, some of our intestinal glands, the unicellular glands, all right, and the enteroendocrine glands here, which are going to help secrete, all right, some more of those hormones that we need, all right, which are going to influence what's happening here. All right, questions so far about anything? No? Am I going too slow? I feel like I'm going slow. No? All right. No, okay, good question. This right here is the intestinal villi. Villus. You can do villus villi, depending on how. I didn't take off for grammar so much. Trust me. If you got that, I was happy. Okay. So how do things move through all right, the small intestine? Remember, peristalsis is the movement of the chyme or food product from a proximal location to a distal location, all right? So we still have peristalsis occurring here, all right? But we also have segmentation, 
Okay, remember we have two layers of smooth muscle, the circular layer, the longitudinal layer. The longitudinal layer is going to help with peristalsis, okay, helping to move the food content through small intestine. The circular layer is going to help with segmentation. That's that back and forth that I was telling you about, like the dish, not the dishwasher, but the clothes washer. It's going to swing that food back and forth, all right, across, all right, the plique circularis, which will help to mix up the chyme and the glandular secretions, okay? And so it's going to move, and as it's going against the plique circularis, those circular folds, it's going to expose chyme to more of the brush border. Okay, it's a really cool system, right? Just grinding it over, just exposing it, right? Isn't it easier to melt cheese when you grate it, all right, than just by putting the block of cheese on your on your grilled cheese sandwich, all right, or whatever you're going to put it on, okay? Similar type of concept. You're increasing the surface area, all right? But that's what happens here, all right? We break that food down and we just kind of move it back and forth over the brush border here. Okay, so in the beginning of the intestinal phase, all right, in the beginning, we see primarily segmentation. Swish, swash, swish, swash, all right, the kind just being pushed forwards and back, forwards and back, all right, in the intestinal phase. At the end of the intestinal phase, all right, that's where we see peristalsis. Okay, that's when we advance the chyme further down the track. Okay, so think segmentation. Let's mix. This is spelled wrong, by the way. That should be a Y. All right, it mixes the chyme up with all of those secretions. And, all right, we still need to get the accessory glands, or glands, excuse me, organs. We got to get their secretions in there too to mix that in. Okay, so we're going to deal with more pacemaker cells. Okay, they're going to spontaneously de depolarize, all right, and stimulate the muscularis, all right, to contract and relax, to contract and relax. Okay, now we've got this other uh, hormone, the motilin, all right, the motilin will help, all right, to stimulate the longitudinal layer, all right, to move that chyme more distally, all right. So it'll actually give like a rhythmic or successive wave type of form of contraction, all right, that will actually move that chyme towards the large intestine. <clears throat> I gotta tell you, when I first learned about the digestive system, I was loving it. It was kind of weird, but... I never thought about all the stuff that went into, especially the, the reflexes involved. All right. Well, 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 speaking of reflexes, we got one. Okay. We actually give it a name. So when you see a lot of reflexes, like the knee jerk reflex, what do you think happens in that one? All right. That's when the doctor smashes you on the knee with the hammer and your leg twitches a little bit. Okay. Well, and this reflex in the, in the gastroileal reflex, all right, we're going to deal here with the ilium, all right, releasing, all right, the chyme through the ileocecal valve. And they'll empty into the cecum. All right, this hormone, CCK, will help with that. Okay, so now you're seeing CCK being released as food enters in. Think about it. We always got to make room for stuff. So as you're eating food, all right, unless you want an impacted bowel, but if you're eating food, you want to move what's in your digestive system, all right, further away from your mouth to make room for what is coming in, okay? So when you have food in your stomach and you start to enter into the intestinal phase and that CCK, all right, that cholecystokinin gets released, starts to shut down the stomach, all right, stimulates the secretion of the accessory glands release of their digestive juices into the duodenum. Well, as that's happening, because food is entering into the duodenum, we've got to move food from the ileum, the distal end of our small intestine, into the large intestine. We've got to make room for stuff. So CCK will actually help 
to stimulate the ileocecal valve to relax, so we can do that. All right? Again, we're still seeing all right, a reflexive type of phenomena occur here. Okay? So as we move food contents from the ileum to the cecum, all right, this all is in response all right, of food being in the stomach. Why? Well, CCK helps, help, happens to have something to do with that. Okay, we just got done emptying the food from the stomach, all right, or some of that food in the stomach into the small intestine, into the duodenum. Okay. All right, let's talk about these accessory glands here. All right, so we're going to first talk about, well, I'm going to show you this picture real fast and then it'll help us out. I'm going to go over, all right, the duct system here of the accessory glands into the duodenum here, all right? So we already know this. We have the right and left hepatic ducts, which come together to form, all right, the common hepatic duct, which will meet up with the cystic duct, all right? Once those two come together and merge, then we get our common bile duct, which will travel retro behind the pancreas, meet up with, all right, the main pancreatic duct, okay? at the hepatopancreatic ampulla, which is this kind of triangular swelling here, all right, on the back side of the duodenum. They'll both come together, all right, and they'll actually merge together at the major duodenal papillae. Now, the major duodenal papillae is the opening, all right, to these two ducts. All right, the sphincter, there's a sphincter inside, it's called the sphincter of Odi, all right, that's the actual sphincter itself, but the opening is the papillae. Okay, so what we're going to see here, all right, these secretions are going to both be released here into the duodenum. Now we have the accessory pancreatic duct, which has a smaller opening, more superior, all right, to the major duodenal papillae. This is the minor duodenal papillae, all right. But our pancreatic enzymes and our bile, all right, is going to come together and be excreted or secreted into this area here, okay. So that's the biliary apparatus. Now, that's what we're talking about. So as we know, when we're talking about the liver, all right, the liver's purpose for the digestive system is to produce bile, okay? And bile is going to have the bicarbonate, all right, the bile salts, cholesterol, lecithin, things to help break down fats and whatnot, okay? So each lobe will have its own duct, okay? They'll come together and they'll form the common hepatic duct, common hepatic duct will then meet up with the cystic duct coming from the gallbladder. They'll both form the common bile duct, okay? And then that will travel to the duodenum, okay? And that will actually meet up with, all right, the common bile duct will meet up with the main pancreatic duct, all right, at what we call the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And it's when both of those come together, all right, they meet up there at the hepatopancreatic ampulla, and they'll excrete, or I keep saying excrete, secrete, all right, their contents into the duodenum, all right, through, all right, the major duodenal papillae there. <clears throat> all right. The accessory pancreatic duct is going to uh, release its pancreatic juice through the minor duodenal papillae. And then the actual sphincter is the hepatopancreatic sphincter uh, in the hepatopancreatic amp ampulla, otherwise known as the sphincter of Odi. Uh, I prefer the sphincter of Odi. I like Garfield. I think it's two Ds, though, ODDI. Okay, so that's this right here, all that you're seeing right here, okay? Common bile duct, meet up with the main pancreatic duct, and it's going to both dump its contents here into the duodenum, okay? So for the liver, all right, when we're talking about its digestive function, all right, 
It's primarily going to be to produce bile. All right, where is it located? It's on the right side of your body, just below the diaphragm, so that is going to be considered the right upper quadrant. All right, it is the largest internal organ in your body. We all know that the skin is the largest organ of your body. All right, what is the purpose of bile? All right, the purpose of bile is to produce, all right, these contents here, water, always need water, okay? Helps to keep the material, all right, more of a liquidy nature, okay? So we decrease abrasion and mechanical stress. All right, bicarbonate, all right? We already know that chyme has an acidic element to it, so this helps to neutralize that. Bile salts will help to decrease or help to digest fats. All right, cholesterol, always need cholesterol, always, okay? Because we're going to talk about, all right, when we start to make these certain lipid molecules, we need cholesterol to make these lipid molecules. You've heard of LDLs and HDLs, the good cholesterol versus the bad cholesterol, all right? So these bile salts will help us with the making of that, all right? Lecithin, again, that's going to help to digest fats, all right? And then mucin, well, like I said, all right, we always need mucus. You can never have enough mucus. All right, so all of that is going to be found in the bile. All right, so the liver makes the bile. The bile goes to the gallbladder where it's going to be concentrated. Okay, so that is the purpose of the gallbladder. It is going to concentrate that bile, and it's going to store it there until you need it. All right, when some sort of reflex occurs, all right, and food enters into the duodenum, then that's where it'll stay, all right? So we'll see that the muscle, muscular layer of the gallbladder, the middle muscularis layer here, will contract due to, all right, cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin CCK causes that muscle layer to contract, all right, and it'll expel, all right, that bile, all right, into the cystic duct. And then it'll meet up with the common hepatic duct. All right, so it'll leave through, all right, the gallbladder through the cystic duct here. There is a, a sphincter valve there, so it actually will control the amount of uh, bile that comes into and what leaves the gallbladder. Okay, now unfortunately, if you do get a cholecystectomy, which is when they remove your gallbladder, you no longer, it's not like you can't make bile, you still make bile, the liver makes it, it just won't be as concentrated, you'll just have a little bit more difficulty digesting fatty meals. So folks that have had a cholecystectomy, uh, it's really recommended that you do not eat uh, fatty meals. And if you do, make sure there's a bathroom nearby, okay? All right, the last accessory digestive gland are go is going to be the pancreas here, right? We've already talked about the endocrine function, so I'm not going to discuss that, all right? We already know, all right, insulin and glucagon, all right, for the endocrine function. I want to get into the exocrine function, all right? Exocrine means it has ducts, okay? It's going to make digestive enzymes, what we call pancreatic juice, all right? This organ is right in the middle, it's above your belly button, right in the middle of your abdomen. Okay, and it is considered to be retroperitoneal, which is interesting to me, all right, because it's going to sit, all right, right above the small and, well, and large intestine, all right, and those regions are both intraperitoneal, so it sits back, all right. So I think of the pancreas like a cane lying on its side, and we all know the, the um, anatomy of it real quick. All right, we've got the head, the body, and then that where it all tapers down at the body is the tail. And at the tail end is, is where the spleen is. All right, the duodenum kind of curls around it like that C shape, all right, up and over. Why am I drawing? I got a picture right here. All right, here you can see it. Okay, so here's the duodenum curling around it. Here's the head down here, the neck, all right, the body of the pancreas at the far end is the tail here. Okay, so you can see how it just kind of wraps around right there. All right. So when we're discussing um, the uh, uh, exocrine component of the pancreas, 
All right. We have two parts to it. We've got a secretory portion and the duct portion. Okay. So the secretory portion, we've talked about these cells before in chapter 17. All right. The acinar cells are going to be the secretory portion. They are going to be cuboidal shaped cells. All right. Like grapes all right, on a grapevine. Okay. That's what these acini will kind of look like. These are going to be, these cells are going to be the ones that make the digestive enzymes, all right? All these enzymes are going to help to break down, all right, proteins and fats and whatnot, okay? So when we start to take these acinar cells, all right, into these sac-like configurations, which we call acini, and we start to group those into larger configurations, we call those lobules, okay? And from these ducts, will have, or from these sacs, will have these small ducts. And in the cells that line these small ducts, we have more cuboidal cells, but these guys make bicarb, all right? Because, keep in mind, all right, the bicarb is going to help to neutralize the acidic chyme, all right? So we don't damage tissue. Okay, so the pancreas is going to create the pancreatic juice, which are all these digestive enzymes. And in addition to that, it's going to make bicarb or the, bi, uh, the alkaline bicarbonate fluid, all right, which will help to neutralize the pH. Now, all these enzymes that this is going to be secreting, all right, are going to be inactive. We have to activate them. Okay, we have to activate them. And we will. All right. But I am going to stop here, and we'll talk about that another time. All right? We're going to get into some good stuff here, but I'm going to stop. All right.